Hi, it's Dr. Sandy Laura Kramers, again, coming to you to record podcast number six. Thank you so much for joining us on the EYE show. And I'm one of the surgeons here at Visionary Eye Doctors, and I wanted to thank all the listeners and those patients and friends of ours who have uh, emailed me back or, or commented on our um, podcast to give us suggestions. I was just hearing from our uh, man behind the scenes, George, about a podcast uh, called Startup, which talks about starting a podcast who says you need about nine episodes to get it right. So I'm getting there. We're at number six. Uh, so thanks for your comments. And I think, uh, you know, the comments I've, I've gotten that I really appreciate are, are the comments, for instance, of questioning what's the purpose of this podcast? Who's your audience? And so initially when I started the podcast, the idea it's, it's for anybody with eyeballs or anybody who cares about people with eyeballs. And obviously it's very general. Uh, some people said, well, why do you talk about faith? I said, I couldn't help it. I'm sorry. And then another friend said, well, the, the eyes are the window to the soul. So why not? And I was like, well, I guess that's true. So I'll try to keep faith to a minimum, but uh, it's part of who I am. So, and then another friend said, you clocked saying the word Harvard three times per hour at the last episode. So I apologize for that, but I'll try to keep that to a minimum also. Anyway, I hope that you'll enjoy these uh, podcasts. And of course, please keep bringing on suggestions of questions you have. Uh, today we're going to talk about one of the main uh, components of something called ocular surface inflammation disorder and that's a big term OSID which encompasses anything related to the eye in terms of inflammation which includes dry eye we've talked about that already meibomian gland dysfunction which is a component of dry eye disease allergic conjunctivitis is what we're going to talk about today but it also includes things like cicatricial inflammation, which is scar tissue, either from a drug, a drug reaction, unknown cause, autoimmune disease, chemical eye burns. Some of you out there have had chemical eye burns and know how devastating that can be. Trauma, uh, something called iatrogenic inflammation, which means it's due to a medical procedure, often refractive surgery or post-surgery like uh, corneal transplant or even cataract surgery, but most commonly associated with LASIK or refractive surgery. And then of course, contact lens related disorder. So that's a big term that we're gonna kind of be working through over the next few podcasts. But today we'll talk about allergic conjunctivitis and go through the causes and the treatments. And this came up because a friend of mine contacted me recently that she had had eyelid surgery with a very well-known doctor in Chicago. And then when she mentioned that her allergies were kicking up, the doctor immediately punted it to the opto her optometrist. And she was taken aback. It's like, this is a doctor that I've been seeing for this eyelid issue and has had a couple of surgeries with him and spent so much time. You think he would have been able to you know, take care of the allergy component. And she was very taken aback by his response. Like, oh, go see your optometrist, you know, that kind of thing. So it reminded me uh, of a question I get asked very frequently. We've touched upon it before in previous podcasts of why eye surgeons have really don't want to deal with these ocular surface inflammatory diseases um, or particularly dry eye disease and allergic conjunctivitis and those classes. Um, so it reminded me of this, of this person that came to visit us a few years ago named Tom Sullivan. I don't know if you all, some of you might remember him. He's still alive. He is a blind actor who uh, has been on Little House on the Prairie and Dancing with Stars, Dancing with the Stars and multiple, I think, movies and so forth that he uh, was born blind. He had something called retrolental fibroplasia. He was born in Boston. Uh, his father, Mr. and Mrs. Sullivan, had taken him to Mass Eye and Ear at Harvard uh, to, to see one of the world famous doctors there, to see what they could do when they realized their baby, their young boy was, was, was blind. And so I think they met with one fair, very famous uh, doctor whose name will go unmentioned because I'm sure he didn't mean it to happen this way. But when uh, he was, I think a couple of years old and they realized he was blind, maybe he was three or four, they saw this very famous doctor. The parents were hopeful there was some treatment. They were hopeful that the surgeon was gonna be able to heal him. And the surgeon came into the room and said, Mr. Sullivan, your son is blind, institutionalize him. And he left the room and that was it. And the father did exactly what he was told. He institutionalized his son. His son obviously had a lot of issues with that. And, but he later went on, Tom Sullivan went, later went on to uh, go to Harvard and get into Harvard and graduate from Harvard. And that's, that's three times, sorry. <laughs> and so he invited 
this very famous professor to his graduation to say, look, even though I was born blind, I've had an incredible life. But it kind of, for me, reminded me of the same issue that a lot of people around the country, around the world have with their surgeon. Surgeons are trained to deal with acute processes often. Not everybody, but a lot of them. They're, they're taught to take the tumor out, to heal the cataract, to treat the problem, goodbye. You move on to the next patient. And whether or not that's good or bad, obviously, you know, we all have our, our personal opinions. Uh, it depends on how you were trained. And so if you're trained as a cutter, which some of us in my residency were trained as a cutter, which means you cut the cornea, do the LASIK, do the surgery, and get moving on to the next patient, uh, you have a different mentality when you have to deal with something that's chronic. So this famous doctor, and Mass Ioneer didn't want to deal with the chronic problem of blindness, did not want to kind of sit even down and explain to the parents what their options were. He wanted to say, I'm sorry, there's nothing I can do, goodbye. And that's what he was trained to do. And that's what happens with a lot of surgeons. So my friend, trying to explain this to her, uh, you know, kind of understood like, well, what kind of surgeon is that? You know, that doesn't take care of the whole person. And I think a lot of doctors in the younger generations are learning more about that. Even my own father, who I've talked about many times, trained as a cardiothoracic surgeon, uh, trained with the most famous surgeons in the country, Dr. DeBakey and Dr. Cooley in Texas, He's becoming very, in his older age, very much about the whole person. He's very much into the diet of the patient. He's trying to get, get to the base of the problem that's causing the inflammation that leads to the need for surgery. So I think things are changing a little bit, but it's important to find, I personally think, the surgeons that are gonna help you understand the whole body. I would include the soul, um, but also the whole person, you know, from diet to lifestyle choices to, of course, how the particular organ is doing, in my case, the eyeball. So we're gonna, I, so I told her I would do my next podcast for allergies to tie, kind of have a surgical perspective uh, and, a, and a doctor perspective on allergies. And what are allergies? Why do they happen? What's the season for allergies? What can you do? What can you do naturally? And what can you do chemically? And what can you do surgically? So there, we're gonna go through all that. So basically, Allergic conjunctivitis is essentially due to many, many issues. We call it multifactorial. It's a hypersensitivity reaction to something. What that means is that your immune system is reacting to either environmental issues or something within your body that's setting off a chemical reaction and a molecular reaction that leads to inflammation. And that is manifested with different cells in your body kind of going kind of haywire. The big ones, the major players, the major actors are things like the mast cell. It's a big, big cell in the, in the body that releases eosinophils. And so you've always maybe heard your mom say, don't rub, you know, don't rub your eyes or don't, you know, scratch uh, that, that uh, little bug bite you have because when you rub the eye or you touch the skin, if you have a bug bite, it literally pushes on the mast cell to make the mast cell what we call degranulate. It bursts the membrane of the mast cell open and inside the mast cell are these wonderful chemicals called eosinophils, very important, but they can lead to massive redness and itching, and that causes a cycle of more inflammation. And so within this whole process are cells called the T lymphocytes and the B cells, and these all are related, that are basically causing more and more inflammation. So it can become a chronic condition. And so within the, the category of allergic conjunctivitis, there's basically six kinds of allergic conjunctivitis. There's one called seasonal allergic conjunctivitis, which many of us have. The season for allergy depends on where you live and it depends on what you're allergic to. Often we say January to the end of summer, it can vary from, from person to person, uh, but it is definitely a seasonal component. There's perennial uh, allergic conjunctivitis, just happens same time every year. The atopic uh, keratoconjunctivitis, there's a issue with the immune system. Sometimes you, some of you may notice these little bumps on the back of your arm. We, t we say that means you have this atopy, which is associated with your immune system. There's vernal keratoconjunctivitis, which means when we flip your eyelid, we see these cobblestones of, of cells that literally can feel like there's sandpaper rubbing against your eye over and over, and it's due to an allergy. Contact, contact lens related uh, allergic conjunctivitis can be due to either the contact lens material or the solution of the contact lens. And giant papillary conjunctivitis, similarly, it can be a reaction to the contact lens or from a different source. But again, you have these large papillae under the eyelid. When we flip it, we see these kind of, kind of uh, not just plaques of inflammation, but these little kind of 
uh, mushrooms, kind of like a little mushroom kind of rubbing against the eye. So those are all the different categories. And many of you have one, many of you have many of them. And so what we try to do is try to understand, well, what is the underlying issue? How can we control that naturally? How can we control that chemi chemically? So as I mentioned, the mast cell is a key component, uh, the histamine release associated with it, T cell activation, all these things that you you've, may have heard, some bottles will say antihistamine, a mast cell in, uh, inhibitor, so that, that's what these are talking about is actually the molecular component. And so there are many natural things you can do to decrease your allergies. And so obviously we try to recommend finding out what your triggers are. So we do recommend early testing to see what you're allergic to. You'd be surprised how many people are really allergic to dust mites. When I was a resident, we never even heard of such thing. I mean, okay, yeah, you're allergic, but how do you prove that? Or do you really need to clean out your, your filters of your ducts of your house and how often? And do you know what kind of detergent? Nobody ever talked about that. You know? and even now it's really hard to prove does mold cause allergy do you have to have mold remediation we really have very little proven perspective randomized controlled studies on these but there's so many patients that swear that when they had mold they were terribly itchy all over and then when they got rid of mold so there's probably a component certain things do trigger certain patients so number one is finding out your triggers trying to block them from your life block them from your eyes and so whether that means changing houses get, getting rid of carpets, uh, having the dog be outside, not in your bedroom, not in your bed. Uh, it's not the dog so much as that they bring in things from outside. Those things are very important. Closing windows when you're sleeping and the fan is on. Think about what it's, you know, kind of stirring around the air uh, and hitting your eye. We know that allergies affect dry eye patients and dry eye patients have sometimes worse allergies and they're related because when you have dry eye or your meibomian glands don't produce enough oil or the lacrimal gland doesn't produce enough water, when you get an allergen in the eye, it doesn't flush it out the way it should and then it sets up more of this chronic cycle of inflammation. So they're related and they can make each other worse. So we do recommend these natural things as much as you can, uh, such as even wearing the uh, Xena glasses. So these are kind of goggle glasses. Amazon has ski goggle glasses that kind of just provide a little seal to try to keep the allergens away. Some people will put uh, kind of even like a saran wrap around them if there's a little gap because their face doesn't fit well in these glasses. So you're just trying to isolate your eyeballs and your eyes away from the rest of the environment. Some people are allergic to their secretary's perfume. I've heard that, uh, all kinds of things. So think about those moisture chamber glasses when you're sleeping at nighttime, uh, trying to avoid the air from hitting your eyes, especially if you tend to turn a lot, sometimes the eyelid opens up. The classic diagnosis or the classic symptom of allergy is itching. So itching is usually due to two things. Number one, allergy, and number two, a virus. And if it's very, very severe itching, we always think of what's called adenovirus or like a viral conjunctivitis, but most often itching is due to some type of allergy and it can be made worse with dry eye. So that's why it is one of the symptoms of dry eye, but most often there's an underlying allergy. So that's one of the key symptoms. Then that release of the eosinophils like we talked about can lead to redness, sometimes swelling, uh, sometimes even discomfort. So those are the key symptoms of allergic conjunctivitis. And so whenever you have any type of redness or itching, we tell people use cold compresses or cold ice or cold artificial tears without preservative because we're trying to use the cold compresses to stabilize the mast cell membrane so it doesn't degranulate. We know that heat makes redness worse, heat makes itching worse, heat can sometimes even make pain a little bit worse, and cold is good for all those three things. But with the eye and the eyelid, it's kind of confusing because we need the heat to open the meibomian gland at the base of the eyelid, eyelashes and the eyelid. We need the heat, we need the blinking, we need a little bit of the massaging. But if you're a patient that has ocular rosacea or chronic allergic conjunctivitis, that heat, even though we need to do it, can make the symptoms of redness, itching, swelling, pain worse. So then you put cold. So we say heat minimum twice a day. You might need to follow it with cold compresses or cold artificial tears or cold ice packs. But whenever you're in the middle of the day or you wake up with terrible itching, we always have cold you know, to kind of decrease the swelling or put ice on your, your bags and so forth that's trying to decrease swelling. That cold is really important as well. So it's kind of confusing, but you're using it for different reasons and different cells respond differently to heat and cold. So just to, so you know, uh, we recommend things like showering frequently. So 
there's top 10 things, top 10 natural things I wanna just go through really quickly. So number one, know your allergies. Uh, know, get a quick allergy test, very easy to do. Most eye doctors even do it now. Uh, most, uh, of course, uh, allerg allergists do this, but even most ophthalmologists and optometrists have that technology. Number two is shower with cold water as frequently as you can. Cold showers are awesome for many reasons, but especially if you have allergies, you wanna just get the pollen and things off your body, uh, change clothes if you need to when you're going inside. Number three is your healthy diet and drinking a lot of water, at least 64 ounces flushes out your system and help stabilize cells. We recommend, as you know, a low inflammatory diet. I have so many patients that have told me their allergies got under, under better control when they got rid of the gluten, sugar, and dairy. It's not easy, but I'm on that diet. I know how hard it is, but we have a lot of patients that notice a difference with that, even with mosquito bites. Mosquitoes love a blood full of sugar as much of, as much as you know we love sugar. And so if, you're, if your blood is not really sugary, there's a lot of data to show that you are not as attractive to certain kind of uh, insects like mosquitoes. Number four is consider alternative treatments. Uh, butter burr is one of the most promising, uh, apparently, extracts available, and it's called ZE339 as an antihistamine. It's natural. I have not tried this. I have not seen a prospective randomized controlled study, but a friend of mine forwarded this to me. So look at the research on these different types of alternative treatments that seem to be over the counter and not have much of a risk. Uh, number five, we talked about the cold ice packs and cold compresses over the skin. Number six, a neti pot, which I love for all kinds of things to prevent viruses, but just even kind of irrigating out your sinuses if you're prone to sinusitis or allergic sinusitis or allergic rhinitis, cleaning that by putting basically a combination of either uh, three teaspoons of uh, basically salt with some water with with one teaspoon of baking soda mixing it in a little kind of one cup of water sometimes that's enough to kind of clean out your sinuses most people i know just use the salt and the water you don't need the baking soda um, but basically you're just trying to try to go in through one nostril out the other gargle with it just trying to clean out your mucous membranes Number seven is keep your home clean. Uh, now that's that's a double-edged sword. So in other words, we have a lot of data to say if you're if you have children and your children grow up in kind of like a dirty environment, they actually have less allergies as opposed to a sterile environment. But once you are older and you you know you have an allergy to dust mites or let's say uh, certain people are allergic to cockroaches and things like that, obviously you try to keep your house house uh, clean. Uh, number eight is inhale steam. You know, whenever you're very kind of congested and you're not sick, you just have allergies, even just inhaling a little bit of a boiling uh, pot of water, just putting a little bit of cover over your you know, head or just don't, don't burn your eyes or anything, but just inhaling some steam or sitting in a room where somebody's taking a hot shower or you're taking a hot shower sometimes helps. And then number nine is basically avoiding smokers and smoking, which I recommend for everybody anyway. And number 10, which is kind of sad to say during COVID, during the past year of COVID, but wear a mask, you know, obviously protect your nose from the inhalation of the allergens. So those are kind of the natural things that, that we've recommended over the years that do seem to help. Uh, there's really little in terms of randomized controlled, double-blinded studies that I know of on some of these things, but they do make sense, very low risk. And then in terms of the drugs, so a lot of people tend to go right for the drugs. And I don't recommend that. I do try to recommend just the natural things first. But if you find that you don't have time to do the natural things or you just feel like they haven't worked for you, uh, the gold standard number one is antihistamines, just trying to decrease the histamine, whether it's a drop or a pill. Some people need both. Uh, number two are mast cell stabilizers. Usually as a drop, there's many, many categories. I think I have, there's hundreds of them. I don't think I have one that I would recommend in particular, but there's a bunch of them that do help uh, I think this is one of them, uh, Zetravate, let's see if it says it on the bottle. Sometimes it'll actually say what, what's the mechanism for it to be used. The problem with a lot of these anti, uh, antihistamines is they have preservative, which is BAK, uh, benzyl, uh, that stands for benzyl alconium chloride, which can be irritating to cells. So some people are allergic to the preservative in these drops, and it's hard to find a preservative free version of these drops. That's why my first recommendation after the cleaning routine, uh, which I mentioned to patients, keep the eyelids clean, keep them free from pollen, is cold artificial tears non-preserved. And so my uh, 
patients who are listening to the video can see I'm holding up an example of what they look like. They come in these tiny little containers usually that are a little annoying to use, but you want to use ideally first a preservative free artificial tear and putting it in the refrigerator or the freezer for a couple minutes before you use it helps decrease that inflammation. So first cleaning and then I have, you've seen this on my blog, some of you is my uh, overwhelming stepladder for all the allergies in the world, which uh, treating all the allergies, <laughs> um, all the treatments for allergies is basically the cleaning. Uh, we recommend still the diet, cold artificial tears, and then we talk about the over-the-counter drops versus prescription drops. So all the things that I'm mentioning in terms of antihistamine mast cell stabilizers, there's an over-the-counter version you can try first. Then there is prescription versions of those two, and so those tend to sometimes work better for some patients, but most insurances don't cover any of the prescription anti-allergy drops at all anymore. And they can be somewhere between four, 300 to like $600 a month, which is kind of crazy. So just think about the natural things first and over the counter. So in terms of drug categories, besides the non-preserved artificial tears are the antihistamines, number one, number two, mast cell stabilizers, number three, non-steroidal drops. This is an example called Ketorolac. It's generic. They come in brand names also, but these can also be very expensive and sometimes not covered by insurance, and they burn often when they go in, so that has a negative side. And then number four are the steroids. We love steroids because they work so well. The problem is, is that long-term, they have the risk of developing a type of cataract that happens in young people, and it can cause glaucoma, which is a technically, it's a blinding disease. So we don't like to use steroids over a long period of time. So we try all the natural things first, if you are absolutely miserable, your eyes are swollen shut, you cannot even breathe properly, your eyes are just not able to function, and the over-the-counter and then these early, the lower-tiered prescription drops are not wor working, we of course give you the steroids, but we try to really minimize it over your lifetime. And then the fifth category are called immunomodulatory drugs, and these include things like cyclosporin A, also known as Restasis or Sequa, they're not FDA approved for allergies as far as I know, especially not CEQA. I have an example of what Restasis looks like. This is definitely approved for dry eye disease. The CEQA is approved for dry eye disease. I don't think it's approved yet for allergies, but it does work for allergies, so we'll use it off-label for allergies. And the CEQA, the prescription uh, for the uh, cyclosporin, which is basically a very strong uh, anti-modulatory agent, is 0.05%, and the CEQA is 0.09%. The cyclosporin does come from a fungus, uh, which I just wanted to mention because both of them, uh, both the med medications I'm going to mention, tacrolimus, which is a new one, and cyclosporin come from different types of uh, organisms. So the fungus that comes for cyclosporin is Buveria nivea, and the tacrolimus, which is a new macrolide, uh, is coming from the fermentation of Streptomyces. Sucotubanesis, which I thought was kind of interesting. So just so you're aware that these are actually based on biology from organisms. And then my favorite immunomodulatory uh, category are the biologics. And we have a lot of success with patients using their own serum, their own platelet-rich plasma uh, to help modulate their inflammation. Both it works for dry eye disease and it works very well for our allergic conjunctivitis. And that comes from your own blood. We isolate just the serum or we isolate just the platelets and they work really well for those. Other things that do help are amniotic membrane or amniotic membrane drops or Procara, which is like a contact lens with the amniotic membrane. We've had success with core blood serum and even stem cell drops. So these are all the biologics that are trying to decrease inflammation at the basic level. And so those are the things that I wanted to talk about in terms of helping with the symptoms. Uh, if you have any questions, let me know. I hope this was helpful and just keep, uh, Keep your eyes clean, keep blinking as you listen to people and listen to me or talk to people, and hopefully uh, your allergy season will be short this year. Have a great day, bye-bye.